If you have your Bible with you, we're going to read from uh, the book of Philippians and chapter 4. Philippians and chapter 4. We'll not read all this passage. It is a familiar passage, and I trust that probably many of you have already quite a bit of it memorized over the years. Philippians chapter 4, and we'll break in at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Then we move down to verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And our last verse is verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. May God bless his word today to our hearts and I would encourage you to read the whole chapter sometime if you're not familiar with this particular passage. I mentioned last Lord's Day morning as to what I was going to speak about today and I want to, as much as possible, try to get it into just one sermon. Seems to be, as I was saying at the prayer meeting on Tuesday night, whenever we're looking at the subject of the locus and we didn't get through it, and eventually I want us to look at the subject of God restoring unto us the years the locusts have eaten, those wasted times in our lives, and even as believers, the opportunities that has been missed or wasted in all of our lives. My topic this morning, for those that may listen to the service here, or those who may listen to it on YouTube, is simply this here, the biblical response to social anxiety. I want you to get that today. I'm not preaching primarily today about social anxiety. You'll have plenty of doctors will talk about it. You'll have plenty of social workers will refer to it. There'll be plenty of psychiatrists that will go down that line, and we thank God, of course, for all of their help. But I want us to focus on the biblical response to social anxiety. How should you and I react uh, in the midst of anxiety? And we find the answer in Philippians chapter 4. And perhaps we can quote these verses we have memorized these verses, and yet at times maybe our hearts can be so troubled whenever God allows us to pass through some particular experience. I want to say to your friends this morning that the reason why I'm preaching on this subject is because I feel that I should, and I feel that there is a need also to preach on it today. I think if there's anything this last two years has done, it has transformed people. It has put people into fear in many, many ways. And I, some of the messages that I've preached over these last couple of years about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, or as our text and our church calendar reminds us, that I will keep them in perfect peace, whose mind is dead in thee, because he trusteth in thee. Very easy to memorize these, those verses, but we've got to put them into practice if we are the professed people of God. And one thing that I mentioned on Thursday night about the locust, the locust is a very reclusive kind of a creature, and yet what I'm going to focus on this week, because I didn't get it covered last Thursday, as to how not only is it reclusive, but also it is made to be part of a community. And those of you that saw the video last week, you will have noticed as to how those locusts that are reclusive, in so many ways, they become a swarm of billions whenever they join their community. 
Social anxiety is a rapidly growing problem in today's society. Uh, while we can easily spend hours interacting with others through social media, for many the thought of face-to-face -face encounters is very, very scary. Now, a book that I would encourage any of you to read, I think I've got my last copy returned to me again, is a book that was sent out by CARE. I bought a couple of copies where it just says, The Robots Are Coming. And it was written a few years ago. It mentioned in the next 10 years, I probably bought it about four or five years ago, as to how uh, the people of this world are becoming like robots. You walk through nearly any town, people have things in their hands, have things in their ears, they're talking to themselves as they're walking and all the rest of it, and we are becoming more and more like robots. That is a terrific book I, to read. You sit down at a train station, sit down in a doctor's surgery, sit down maybe even in a restaurant if you go to those places, and the first thing you will notice at a very a casual observation, the first thing you see coming out is the robot, the mobile phone, to keep connected to people. I want to say that I am not decrying the mobile phone. I'm not decrying social media today. There is good, there's good that can be used. But I'm just saying this here, that there is a biblical response to social anxiety. And I'm going to read, or I'm going to quote today, a few articles that has appeared this week in the Times, which I've read, and I've jotted them down. They've also appeared in some other newspapers, and I believe that as parents or grandparents or as neighbours, we need to know what the biblical response is whenever someone in our families or our community is facing social anxiety. Now, I know, of course, those that face social anxiety who do not come to the house of God, but they have no problem playing sports, they have no problem doing other things. And so that tells me something else, which I'm going to focus on about the response, the biblical response to social anxiety. Now, the signs of social anxiety abound. Uh, there's some indicators whenever we face them. Uh, anxiety is uh, something that maybe comes to the fore whenever you dread answering the door or the telephone. Now, I know that you in the church here know that at the start of COVID, I shielded for 12 weeks. My hands were bleeding because of that stuff that you put on them. And I, after 12 weeks, I said, I don't think that God wants me to live like this. I think if I got a ladder today, no matter what happened in the future, I don't think I'd be going down that route again, to be honest. But I say this here, dear friends, I, in social anxiety, you can dread answering the phone or even the telephone. You don't want perhaps anyone in your home. Isn't that the way so much of the community is today? Bound and shackled I, because of what has been happening over these last couple of years. You avoid events out of a fear of embarrassment. Now, anxiety is triggered by many things, including some physical conditions. There may be psychological conditions also. But depending on the disorder, there's much treatment that is offered out there. But I'm going to skip eventually to the biblical response. There's counseling. I'm not decrying counseling today. But again, I believe that our best counselling will be found in the Word of God. We know it can uh, trigger uh, certain responses depending on the disorder. And so the treatment can be self-help treatments. And probably if you attend a counsellor, that's probably the main one that they will go for is self-help. Looking at your life, evaluating your life, asking yourself, are you taking on too much in your life and all the rest of it? But I don't know whether a counsellor will ever ask you, are you involved too much in the work of God? No, a secular counselling, I think, will take an opposite view. There's also professional therapy. There's medication, or there's a combination of all these. And I'm not decrying any of them for a moment. But for the believer, dear friend, 
reading God's word, prayer, and fellowship will be important ingredients in overcoming social anxiety. There are some general characteristics of social anxiety in public places, such as work, such as meetings, and so on. And we all know the effects of it in the work of God, and the effects of it even upon children, sadly, that all this last two years has produced. And it's sad. And you will have read in the news this morning that there's a great percentage of children that are waiting to see psychiatrists. And of course, the outcry in Northern Ireland is this week, there's a tremendous shortage of them. Again, thank God for them and for the help that they can give to individuals. We know that even shopping, people with social anxiety feel as if everyone is watching them and staring at them, even though, uh, rationally speaking, they know that can't be true. In fact, they can never relax whenever others are around. It always feels as if others are evaluating them, being critical of them, or even judging them in some particular way. Isn't that so true? I think you'll have to agree with that. Many with social anxiety simply must be alone. Must be alone. I close doors behind them. And I'll move on eventually and say that is not God's way for any individual. Yes, of course, a person can go into a very dark place, maybe with depression, where, like in Psalm 42, they want to be alone. But then the psalmist came out of that depression in Psalm 43, whenever he goes to the house of God. And that was the important thing in the life of the psalmist in the midst of his depression. He heads to the house of God. And he says he will offer uh, the sacrifice of praise unto God. Let me ask or try to look at today the cause of social anxiety. There's lots of symptoms out there, but let's try to diagnose the problem. Where is this fear coming from? Where is it coming from? And I can tell you, dear friend, the amazing thing is much of this fear is amongst Christians. And that, to me, tells me its own thing also. Much of the fear is, I'm not saying it all is, but much of it is whenever God has told us to fear not. Do we know better than God is the question. And of course we don't. Where is the fear coming from? And again, I've said that on our church calendar, remember that little text, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stead on thee. The problem today, and I would encourage you to listen to that sometime if you don't remember it, that's on YouTube. The problem is for many believers, their mind is not fixed on God. And that's why they're not at peace. Their mind is fixed on their job, their family, their security, everything else. Their mind is of the God who saved them. Now, you may agree with me today, you may disagree with me today, and that's fine. But I preach the word of God as I find and I believe the scriptures teach us. We minimize sometimes over the social anxiety our own self-worth. We feel ourselves nothing good. Nothing true, nothing beautiful about us. And this will show itself in very condemning thoughts like, look the way I live. I, the way I, I, look at the life I live. Look at the way I look. There's no good in me. There's nothing I can do with my life. If there's one thing I feel for, and that is children that are growing up and children that have grown up in homes that has produced an inferiority complex. It's not always good to keep putting a child down. I've said before, there's such a thing as the transference of feelings. If you love your children, there's things you'll protect your children from. There's one thing that we've always said about doing in the ministry, and that was that our boys would never be burdened with our problems and our concerns. They would never head out to school weighed down by our cares because I wouldn't fail for a moment or all of either. 
that that would be right. Sadly, a lot of children do. And so there's the cause, and this shows itself in these condemning thoughts that uh, maybe uh, individuals don't like talking, they don't like the sound of their voice, they can't go out with friends because their friends are better than them, they're funnier than them, they're more attractive than them. Teens report lower self-esteem and self-evaluation uh, um, and engaging with others. And then the little article that I read this week, it said this here, to give you the quotation, teens report lower self-esteem and self-evaluation when engaging in uh, other comparison sites and I'd mentioned some of these. Now, I'm not boast, boasting today, but I just don't have an interest in these. I, and so if you have, that's up to you. But these comparison sites, I'm going to mention what the study said. It said Facebook and other social media sites. For example, this includes looking at profiles of what peers passed about the healthy habits the fun social events or the accomplishments. I was in I touched uh, this week with a neighbour, not locally here, but I uh, just some miles away from here, where tragically there was, there was a young man who took his own life just a fortnight ago. And you know, dear uh, friends, today you and I need to seek to prepare our children for that big world out there and coping. It's always something that greatly concerns me. But then I'm going to go back again. I'm going to quote from the Times. Now, the reason we have the Times is because a family member bought us the Times. And so that's why, and I must say, we really do enjoy it. Gives you an idea as to what's happening in the world. And so if you are reading it this week, you will notice that there's an article about teenagers. Now you remember that Tony Blair, our former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, whenever his son Ewan was caught with drugs many, many years ago, Tony Blair made a statement and he said that being a Prime Minister is a very hard thing, but being a parent is more difficult. He had that experience. But this article said this here, teenagers on social media have increased exposure to harm, social isolation, depression, anxiety, and cyberbullying. Now, that is not my quote. That's in the paper. How social media affects teenagers' self-esteem. The experts worry that social media and text messages that have become so much part of teenage life are promoting anxiety and lowering self-esteem. The survey results found that, and I'm quoting these, I don't know what these are, you probably do. The survey results found that Snapchat, whatever that is, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram all led to increased feelings of depression, anxiety, poor body image, and loneliness amongst teenagers. Now I'm going to quote from the Child Mind Institute, and I said this here about indirect communication. Now, friends, today, I've heard many comment that even grandchildren, even whenever they're visiting, as to how they sit on mobile phones today. And so many don't know how to communicate. Now, I know if I was visiting in some of somebody's house and somebody sits watching a television, they would ever tell me something. You're in the road. You're in the road. And you go to read and pray and the television's blaring away. Well, I would imagine that you're probably wasting your time. But about indirect communication that teens are masters at keeping themselves occupied in the hours after school, this article said, when not doing their homework, and then in brackets, even whenever they are. <laughs> They're online, on their phones, taxing, sharing, trolling and scrolling, for one thing, modern teens are learning to do most of their communication while looking at screens. I don't know whether you agree with that or not, but again, that's an article this week. Certainly speaking interactively creates a barrier to clear communication. 
But that's not all it said. It said learning how to make friends is a major part of growing up. Making friends. God does not intend you to live a reclusive life. Not for a moment. Friendship requires a certain amount of risk-taking because you take risk whenever you let someone become part of you. And this is true for making a new friend, but it's also true for maintaining friendships. It takes courage at times to cross over those bridges. Using, of course, phones and other social media, maybe we don't have to do that. But at times we maximize others' perceived assessment or judgment of us. Our greatest fear is that others are having the very same thoughts about us as we are having ourselves. No matter how much we remove ourselves from society, we can never escape from our own doubts, our own fears, our own self-hatred. For some with social anxiety, they've been victimized in the past by some sort of trauma or by an overbearing, critical parent. What causes anxiety? Anxiety is caused by real or imagined threats to our well-being. Threats such as social rejection. I don't fit in with anybody. Threats like physical injury, disease, poverty, death, and a list of others. I want you to just take note today because I think that it's important to mention this, that anxiety has three main elements. The first is insecurity. Insecurity. Where someone feels something bad is going to happen to me. The second is helplessness. There's nothing I can do. The third is isolation. There's no one there. To help me. And that's not the best place to go. And maybe, dear friend, there's a parent here today, or maybe you're as an individual and you're experiencing that insecurity, helplessness, isolation. Emotionally, they cause as much anxiety as if they were imagined, even, or if they were real. Now, I'm going to quote, dear friends, and I'm I must say that there's part of this I'm not going to quote, but I would encourage adults to look it up. Because in a meeting like this, I wouldn't quote this part of it. But I will encourage you to look it up as an adult. This is in the Times on Tuesday past. It's under the title, Most Under Five Spend Too Long Staring at Screens. Too much time in front of television or in smartphones, according to this research. This is research, and you can determine whether it's fact or not. But I said this here, the screen time has been linked to delayed development of skills such as language and sociability. Now, I'm quoting from the Times, and so maybe if you're on the internet, you can, you can read this. It goes on, the study looked at 90,000 children, that's a lot of children, from 63 studies across the world, including the UK. Now, the World Health Organization says children below the age of two should not look at screens at all. It said the guidelines suggest that those aged two to four should be limited to screens to just one hour per day. Those aged two to four. Now it's difficult to I uh, maybe I uh, evaluate all this, but this is the survey that was done in the Times. Difficult to monitor what is being watched, maybe, in the news. But in the news, again on the fifteenth of February this week, I said this here about a children's game. And I'll give you the name of the game. And if you as a parent feel that you have children and you need to check out what are children actually watching these days, well then you, you have a responsibility as a parent. This is in the Times here. Uh, you, it was, on, uh, uh, it was uh, rather, it's been watched on the news in the BBC on the 15th of February. The children's game, the title is The Children's Game with a Sax Problem. Now it goes on and it says that in that game there's a naked man Wearing just a dog collar and a lead, he's led across the floor by a woman in a bondage outfit 
Two strippers dance next to a bar, and I wouldn't go on as to what happens next. But isn't it amazing that children could be watching even? And I said this here. This is on the BBC website. It is one of the most popular children's games in the world. One of the most popular children's games. Is it any wonder that this world of ours and the whole family situation is crumbling all around us? And so I'll say to you, you do have a responsibility. Oh, it's very easy to hand a child something and have quietness and so on, but I want to say we need to know what's been watched. The article said, particularly worrying, is children and adults potentially socialising together in open spaces. Isn't that something? Now I come to the biblical response, and it's just two minutes to half twelve, so I can't get it in. <laughs> well, I say this here, I'm going to just leave you the first part to even think about it. The biblical response, COVID, I believe, has produced great fear and also has the media. Now, many will seek to live a reclusive lifestyle. No matter how much we remove ourselves from society, we can never escape our own doubts, our fears, and our self-harm. The Christian recognises that this is not an option. It's not an option. Why not? The Bible tells me that we are social creatures. We're made one for another. And that's why God's people, and I make no apology whatsoever for saying it, that God's people who can go to the hairdresser and go to the barber and go out shopping and all the rest of it, but this fear, whenever it comes to the house of God, there's a bigger problem. That's a symptom of another problem. And so I want you to say that, uh, to, to notice that we are social creatures. We're made to interact with others. We're image bearers of God, and we will thrive of interaction. Now, I'm going to conclude with this quote, and if you find anything different in the Word of God, you come to me and put me right. I think that's a very fair way to say it. That in the wake of creation, amidst all the benedictions that was going, God makes this world, and he goes on and he keeps saying, and God saw it was good, it was good, it was good. But then you come to chapter 2 and verse 18. And what does God say? It's not good. And what he's saying is, it is not good for man to be alone. Not only are we created for community, but we're also called to be part of that community. Well, Christianity is undeniably personal, it is not all private. Christianity is not all private. Oh, I've met Christians in the past and they've said to me, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. There's none of them that's true. But the other side is that if you're a Christian, you'll want to get out to the house of God somewhere to worship God. This, of course, manifests itself clearly in the call to belong to the local church. I'll conclude with an 18th century Scottish theologian, and then I'm going to have to go into part two. Maybe I'll get out a wee bit earlier next week. Uh, but a 19th century Scottish theologian, James Bannerman, he went so far as to say that according to the arrangement of God, the Christian is more of a Christian in society <coughs> excuse me, than alone and more in the enjoyment of privileges of the spiritual kind when he shares them with others than when he possesses them apart. Hebrews chapter 10. We've already preached on it in the past. And no matter if people agree with it or people don't agree with it, if people disagree with the word of God, that's between them and God. We are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so much more as we see our Saviour coming back again. I'll end it there. Andrew can put on the web that this is part one, and God willing, next week we'll get into really the biblical response. I've just given you the first part. God said it's not good. 
If you want to live a reclusive life, closed away from society, it's not good. It's not God's way. May God bless his word to our hearts. Our concluding hymn I this morning is Jesus has loved me, wonderful saviour. Jesus has loved me, I cannot tell why. And we'll stand to sing. Father, your word tells us that God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. And I pray, Lord, even in these difficult days, whenever there's been much anxiety around, maybe even parents and neighbours and friends hardly know how to react to it all. We thank you that you've given to us your word. We thank you that whenever we're in Christ, that you're the one who is a lamp onto our feet, your light onto our path. And I pray, Father, if there's any in our gathering this morning and they're struggling with the very thing that we're speaking about, help them to realise that their Heavenly Father knoweth all about them. And it's not your will, Lord, even for us to live like this, because you want us to live as part of a community. Bless those who go from us now, those that tarry around your table. Will you lead us afresh to Calvary? In your name we pray. Amen.